We are beginning the second chapter of the book of Romans tonight. And as we look at the book of Romans, one of the major themes that's used, the term righteous is used over 60 times in the book of Romans. And so it's a major theme, and it tells us this about God, that righteousness is an attribute of God. He always does what is right. On the other side, people are not righteous. And Romans teaches us how God, in His righteous justice, relates with sinful humanity in two ways. First of all, He declares righteous those who turn to Him in faith, as we saw in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. And He will continue this teaching at the end of chapter 3. But God is also wrathful against sinful humanity when they do not acknowledge Him and accept His gift of salvation. We looked at the last part of chapter 1 where God's righteousness was shown in His wrath in punishing humanity because of general revelation. Creation bears clear witness to God as Creator and the evidence is clear for every person to see. And so in summary of what we looked at a couple of weeks ago, general revelation is God's divine disclosure of Himself through creation that He exists and is worthy of our worship. The second thing is people are guilty before God because they choose to ignore general revelation that reveals God as the Creator and the sustainer of the universe. And then the last point I want to review from last time was that people who refuse to acknowledge God are under God's wrath and therefore abandoned to pursue evil that will destroy them and others. And we see this lived out in our world today that is increasingly turning away from a God. And as a result, God's wrath is being revealed not by sending fire from heaven, but by abandoning sinful people to their own demise. Now we move to chapter 2, where Paul deals with the second justification for God's wrath upon a humanity. He changes his style here, though, as he addresses someone who at the end of chapter 1 stands in hearty agreement on the judgment God is bringing upon the wicked in the previous verses. Look at verse 1 with me. You may think you condemn, can condemn such people. The people he's talking about is the ones at the end of chapter 1 that he talks about. But you're just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you're condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. Paul addresses this person that is in judgment on others by talking about them six times with the pronoun you. You look at this verse, there's you, 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 you. And it's very accusatory that Jesus or, or Paul is talking to them. So who is he talking about in this you? I think we could go back to verse 16 of chapter 1 to determine who this is where Paul said, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. So Paul has divided humanity into two groups, the Jew and the Gentile. He addressed the Gentile world at the end of chapter 1 who was deserving of God's wrath because they refused to acknowledge Him in general revelation as the Creator who was worthy of their obedience and worship. But now Paul is addressing the Jews who are worthy of God's wrath because they were God's chosen people and not only had general revelation, but they also had special revelation. They had been given the Old Testament Scriptures that were there to guide them to Christ. 
And this, speci this section specifically is dealing with the Jews. But I would expand it out, and I think Paul would too. To any, it applies to anyone who has had access, access to the Scriptures but are not saved. Martin Luther explains in his commentary regarding this self-righteous attitude that the Jews had. He says this, This mistake of condemning others though guilty themselves is committed by all who are outside of Christ. For while the righteous, true believers, make it a point to accuse themselves in thought, word, and deed, the unrighteous, unbelievers, make it a point always to accuse and judge others, at least in their hearts. The righteous invariably try to see their own faults and overlook those of others. The unrighteous look for good in themselves and for evil in others. And for this reason, Paul is speaking about the transgressions of the world in general in the previous section. Now he shows that the self-righteous who have God's word are just as guilty as those who stand in judgment over the others because they sin as well. And again, this reminds us of two things that we've already looked at. Only God is righteous and always does what is right. And every human being is unrighteous and doesn't always do what is right. And I want to emphasize the last part of that. It's not that we are horribly wicked and always doing sin and always doing what's wrong. But we are unrighteous and we cannot stand before a holy God. See, when a person is self-righteous, they place themselves above other people and are guilty before God. Jesus illustrates this in a parable. Look at what he said in Luke. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. And he's specifically talking about and talking to the religious leaders of his time. It said, two men went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other, sinner, other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This parable is actually a commentary on the whole entire passage we're looking at here in Romans. Again, Paul is specifically addressing Jews who were self-righteous because they were God's chosen people. But he is also... Uh, they can, And again, they were condemning of other Gentiles. And again, this was a problem Paul had everywhere he went to plant a church. He would start in the synagogue and eventually go to the Gentiles. But the Jews always looked down upon the Gentiles and they condemned them. And they believed as well that they were exempt from God's wrath because He was His chosen people. But they were under God's wrath as well as he states in Romans chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. He says this, And we know that God, in His justice, will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Again, the same things Paul is speaking of in this passage is committing 
some of those sins that were listed at the end of chapter 1, which was an extensive group of sins. In a study of the history of the Jewish people from the Old Testament show that they were no different than the rest of the world. After they had received the law from God, even before they came into the land of Canaan, they were sinful and rebellious, and God's wrath was poured out on them in the wilderness on multiple occasions. They had God's visible presence in the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, and the tabernacle was in their midst. Moses addressed the people, and again, they were under God's wrath then. And at the end of Moses' life, as he shares with them his final message, which is the book of De Deuteronomy, he addresses them and he warns them about what they would be like after they conquered Canaan and for them never to think they're superior to others. Look what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. After the Lord, your God, has done this for you, don't say in your hearts, the Lord has given us this land because we are such good people. No, it is because of the wickedness of the other nations that He is pushing them out of your way. It is not because you are so good or have such integrity that you are about to occupy their land. The Lord your God will drive these nations out ahead of you only because of their wickedness and to fulfill the oath He swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You must recognize that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land because you are good. For you are not. You are a stubborn people. So Moses made it very clear that God wasn't giving in the land to Israel and they weren't His chosen people because they were better than everybody else. It was not because they were righteous and not because they were better than other nations, but just because of His sovereign plan to display His righteousness to the world. Israel proved they were just as wicked as the other nations. Even with special revelation, the law and the Old Testament to guide them, the nation of Israel failed time and time again. And they never lived up to the standards of God's righteousness. Therefore, in the answer to Paul's question in verse 3, do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? The answer is no. That God judges fairly leads necessarily to the conclusion that those who do what they condemn in others will receive the same penalty. However, we also see both in the Old Testament and in the present day God's love and patience with His people. We see in the Old Testament with Israel's history that there were many occasions that God chose not to destroy them because of the rebellion. They also were delivered by God from certain death and imminent destruction even though they didn't deserve God's deliverance. God was kind, tolerant, and patient with Israel throughout their history. And Paul reminds them of this in the next verse. In verse 4 of Romans, he says this, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can you see that his, can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? So in this verse, Paul is answering two more parallel questions. He is saying that Israel presumed that the, because they were God's chosen people that they would not be judged by Him. They assumed God would tolerate them regardless of what they did. But God will not continually look the other way regarding their sin. In the Old Testament, God sent prophet after prophet to sinful... <coughs> Israel 
And repeatedly they warned them that this was not the case. One example is Jeremiah, who was sent to, by God <coughs> to Judah for an entire generation to warn and challenge them to repent of their sins before judgment and destruction would come. On one occasion, Jeremiah challenges the religious leaders who claimed that they were safe because of God's temple in Jerusalem. Jeremiah warned them against this presumption and he challenged them to repent of their sin. Look at this passage in Jeremiah chapter 7. It said, The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, Go to the entrance of the Lord's temple and give this message to the people. O oh, Judah, listen to this message from the Lord. Listen to it. All of you who worship here, this is what the Lord of Heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Even now, if you quit your evil ways, I will let you stay in your own land. But don't be fooled by those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple is here. They chant, the Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. But I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and deeds and start treating each other with justice. Only if you stop exploiting foreigners, orphans, and widows. Only if you stop your murdering. And only if you stop harming yourselves by worshiping idols. Then I will let you stay in this land that I gave you to, to your ancestors to keep forever. Don't be fooled into thinking that you will never suffer because the temple is here. It's a lie. Do you really think you can steal, murder, commit adultery, lie and burn incense to Baal and all the other new gods of yours and then come here and stand before me in my temple and chant, we are safe, only to go right back to all those evils again? See, Jeremiah had this message for a whole generation. But Israel didn't repent. And Babylon came and destroyed them in 586 B.C. and carried them away into captivity. Centuries later, God was born a human being in Jesus Christ through Jewish descent. But the Jewish people rejected their Messiah and they crucified Him. Even after the resurrection, God began His church in Jerusalem among the Jewish people, and they were the first that were given the opportunity to repent and come to salvation. But most of them rejected their Savior. And as Paul is writing Romans 50 and 56 A.D., about 30 years later, most of the Jewish people were rejecting Jesus. And just a little over a decade later, in 70 AD, Israel and Jew Jerusalem were completely destroyed by the Romans. And so God condemned the Jewish people, who were even more responsible and accountable for their sinful lives because they were given special revelation, the Bible. They did not repent and believe in their Messiah, Jesus Christ. There are those in the church today who have that same mentality. They think they can live a life of sin, saying that they know Jesus, yet their lives are full of sin, and they do not walk in obedience to the Lord with their lives. Paul is challenging this mentality just because God is wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient with sinners does not mean He will not pour out His wrath on them. And we are never to presume that God will tolerate wickedness forever. Yes, God is kind, tolerant, and patient. Not only with the Jewish people, but with all people. But the reason for this is that His kindness is intended to turn you away from your sin. It is not God's judgment that leads people to repentance, but His kindness. Yet Israel and many people today still do not repent 
in order to be saved. And Paul addresses them in verse 5 where he says, But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming, or wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Peter, later on in his letter, affirms this teaching with what he says in 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10. He said, The Lord isn't really slow, being slow about His promise, as some people think. No, He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. And a few verses later, he said this, And remember our Lord's patience, giving people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. And I think he was referring back to this passage in Romans because Peter wrote this several years after the book of Romans. You see, God is not ignoring sin. He never has. But again and again, God gives people the opportunity to turn to Him in repentance and believe in Christ in order to be saved. There are people today that try to see a distinction between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the Old Testament, God was kind and tolerant and patient with both Israel and the Gentile nations. But He also brought judgment upon them. When you think about the conquering of Canaan, it was 700 years from the time of Abraham going into the promised land and being a witness there to the people in Canaan until Israel came in and destroyed that land. There were 700 years of tolerance. Again, God had judged Sodom and Gomorrah. And I know everyone in the land of Canaan knew about that during Abraham's lifetime. They had their opportunity. But when judgment came, it was complete and it was devastating. And today, God is being tolerant and kind and patient with people, but judgment is coming. Yes, the wrath of God is already revealed in people who have been abandoned by God to do their own destruction. But Paul is saying the time is coming when God will destroy all who have not surrendered to Him by believing in Christ. Paul says this in the next two verses. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. Again, when you look at this passage, it is easy to look at this passage and say, well, salvation must come through good works. But that's not what Paul is teaching. True saving faith results in obedience and godly living. That's what Paul is teaching. You see, Paul teaches throughout Romans and throughout all of his other epistles that salvation, God's forgiveness and eternal life are utterly by God's grace. But he also teaches that true salvation occurs when there's a change based on this truth. Jesus said you must be born again or born from above. It means to be given a new heart and have the Holy Spirit living in you and you leading you to a new life. A changed life will happen producing good actions in a person's life. And so verse 7 is actually saying Eternal life is promised to those who do not regard their good works as an end in themselves, but see them not of human achievement, but from hope in God. 
Their trust is not in their good works, but in God, the only source of glory, honor, and incorruption. Paul goes on and says in the next two verses, but he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth, and instead live lives of wickedness. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, for the Jew first, and also for the Gentile. So on the other side of the ledger, we find a pattern of evil defined in terms of self-seeking and rejection of the truth that leads to divine wrath in terms of trouble and distress. God's judgment is impartial on both the Jew and the Gentile. And Paul further amplifies this in the next two verses where he says this, but there will be glory and honor and peace for God for all who do good, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. When the Gentiles sin, they will be destroyed, even though they never had God's written law. And the Jews who do have God's law will be judged by that law when they fail to obey it. Again, Paul makes this comparison between the two divisions of people that are there, the Jew and the Gentile, showing that all people, whether they have the law, special revelation, or not, are judged equally. He starts with the Gentile, those who do not have the written law, and the Gentile doesn't perish because they lack special revelation or the law, which the Jews have, but they perish because they sin and they do not repent. On the other hand, the Jews will be judged by the law, but this does not imply exoneration because no Jew ever kept the law fully. Paul, Paul's whole purpose in this passage is to undermine the position of a Jew or somebody who has the Bible who is counting on their obedience to the law to be declared righteous by an absolute righteous God. He explains this further in verse 13, where he says, for merely listening to the law does not make us right with God. It is obeying the law that makes us right in his sight. But we know what James said in chapter two, where he says, so whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of the law. And again, I shared this when we were going through the book of James. It's like breaking tempered glass. Have you ever break, broken tempered glass? When you break it, what happens? The whole thing comes apart, doesn't it? And it breaks into little bitty pieces. And that's the way it is with the law. And no one can fully keep the law completely. And so when you break one point, you've broken the whole thing. And so you may only commit a lie, but it's the same as committing adultery or murder. It's the same as stealing. And it's the same as doing evil to your neighbor. And so no one can ever keep the law. And the only one that ever was able to was Jesus Christ. Therefore, no one will ever be made right in God's sight through keeping the law because they cannot do it. So we conclude in this passage, and we're going to pick it up next time as well and go into more depth. But the point is this. All people are under God's wrath. Whether they had the privilege of knowing the law or growing up with the Scriptures, we are left with only one hope. And that right standing with God comes through Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul said what he did in chapter 1. And we're going to look at this in great detail in chapter 3, 4, and 5. Where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. This good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. 
And again, we need to remember when Paul is condemning the Jews, who is he also condemning before he became a Christian? Himself. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. According to the law, he said he was righteous. But when he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, he fell on his face and he realized that he was a sinner just like everyone else and deserved God's wrath. And that's why Paul made it a point of his life with his calling from that moment of salvation that he no longer tried to justify himself or anyone else through keeping the law, but only through trusting in Christ because he understood it is the only way we can be made right in God's sight. And that is the case for all of us today. And again, a lot of people really misunderstand the gospel. And we're going to talk about it some more next time. When you talk to somebody who has not got a firm grasp of the gospel, and probably every one of us in this room before we became a Christian had the same thought. How would you get to heaven? Well, I must do enough good things to outweigh the bad things. But how many good things do you have to have and how many good things do you have to do in order to outweigh one bad thing? We know the answer from the Scriptures. One sin is worthy of eternal death. Just one. And we've all committed many, many more than that. And so there is no good deed that can give us salvation. It is through Jesus' death and resurrection that we have life. And so we come to the end of our sermon and we celebrate that it is Jesus who makes us right with, Jesus, with, uh, with God. He is the one that gives us right standing with God. So if you would come forward and let's get communion and we will take it at this verse. And I've read this verse for many, many years without fully understanding the full implication here. Because Paul is using the Jews to explain to us just how kind and tolerant and patient God has been with every one of us. Again, God from the very outset of the Jewish nation while they were in the wilderness looked at them and knew they were deserving of total annihilation. And when he went into the land within a generation they had started worshiping the very idols that they were told to destroy. And they did that for almost a thousand years before God finally destroyed them in the land. And then he allowed them to go back into the land where they spent another almost 600 years before they were totally destroyed again. And we know from chapter 11 of Romans that God still has promises to fulfill with Israel. Not sure we understand fully when that will be. I think it's at the very end of this age, the church age. But God still has promises for Israel. And so when we look at God's kindness, His tolerance, and His patience, and we look at ourselves in the mirror, we can rest assured that God is kind, is tolerant, and He's patient with every one of us. And I am so glad He is with me. But that is all intended to turn us away from our sin. Paul will say when he gets to chapter 6, he said, because God has been so gracious, should we just continue in more sin that we get more grace? And Paul said, absolutely not. You see, we should never look at God's kindness as God turning His head the other way. But God is calling us to live holy and pure lives, each and every one of us. And that is proof positive, as Paul said in this passage,
that we belong to Him because our good deeds show that we really do know Christ. But again, we need to always remember those good deeds will never save us. They just show that we are saved. We are saved only because of Jesus' death and resurrection. And so we celebrate that as we close. Jesus said, when you eat this bread, you remember my body that hung on the cross for your sin. Let's eat. And Jesus said, when you drink this cup, you remember that it is my blood, my life that was given for you that gives us salvation and nothing else. This drink. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You that we are made right in Your sight through trusting in Jesus. And Lord, nothing that we can do can ever earn that. And Lord, help us to walk by faith knowing that it is through Your Son's death and burial and resurrection where He took upon Himself our sin and that He died our punishment. And when we trust that, we are saved and we are right in Your sight. And help us never to think that we could ever earn it. And help us never to look at others as deserving of more wrath than we deserved. But help us to be loving and kind to others. And help us to be humble and seek to bring them to your salvation as well, Lord. For Lord, we are none of us deserving of it. But you graciously poured it out on us. And help us to offer that to all others as well. Help us to be faithful, to carry forth that message as Paul did. Help us not to be ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to save all who believe. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and close with our benediction. And we will see all of you next week. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.